Um, as is usual, the, the sky notes are, are all a bit lighter, um, but uh, hopefully some pretty pictures and some, uh, some interesting stuff to talk about. I generally start off with a pretty picture at the Christmas sky notes, and I thought this one was really nice. This is taken by Gordon Mackey up in Caithness. Uh, a really nice auroral display. Uh, 14th of October this year. If you remember back to the last Sky Notes, last uh, Christmas I used one of Gordon's pictures as well with this lighthouse here. It's something he uses quite frequently in his, uh, his pictures. I just think this is just such a, a beautiful view of, of again one of those lovely demonstrations of the interaction of physics with astronomy. I mean you can look at this just on the basis of the fact that the, the aurora is a, a beautiful thing to look at. But the physics of how it's the solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetosphere and our atmosphere is, is fascinating too. Um, anyway, of course, all of this comes from this object. This is the sun. Um, not a lot's going on on the, on the sun at the moment. So uh, I know Lynn, Lynn's in the audience, um, a bit like me as comment section director. I think she's got a lot to answer for, for the fact there's not a lot of activity at the moment. There's not a lot of comets either, I have to say. Um, but despite the fact there's not been much solar activity, there has been quite a lot of auroral activity. And uh, these are some really nice time lapses from uh, Dennis Brzezinski, who lives up in Tarbert Ness, uh, between the Moray and the Dornock Firths, a lovely site he's got up there. Uh, really nice dark skies um, and he gets, the only real light pollution he gets is from the aurora. Um, and these are some really nice examples of what he's had recently. So you've got the Pleiades down here rising, Perseus over here. Uh, I really like this. This was one of the, I think this was one of the pictures of the week on the BAA website. I think the, the composition here of the aurora uh, and the graveyard kind of uh, really really gives the impression of sort of silence and, and peace um, maybe I don't know but uh, <laughs> it's it's just another fantastic view of, of uh, a wonderful natural phenomenon which we don't get to see very much from the south of England but uh, those people who who live up uh, north of the border to get to see this quite a bit and and it it does seem to be activity there seems to be a lot of activity around despite the fact the sun's not doing very much um, there are some nice pictures uh, i took these again off the BA website of the of the moon uh, you, this might give you a clue where this picture was taken from it's upside down so this was actually taken from new zealand although that's a very northern hemispheric point of view, the fact that it's upside down. Um, this is one of those things that gets me irritated but seems to have now entered the common currency of the supermoon and it, it, it astonishes me actually quite how often the supermoon appears to, to, to sort of turn up on uh, websites and news sites given how frequently it happens. But uh, yeah, this is the moon basically at full when it's near perigee so it's as, as large as it can be in our skies. This lovely picture by Steve Knight, um, I think just gives a really good, good view of, of the full or nearly full moon taken around that time of, of supermoon. So if you want to get a picture on a BBC News website, take a picture of the supermoon or in fact take a picture of any full moon any time you want and just send it in the next time that there's a supermoon. Because you can't rely on the weather, particularly on the nights of supermoons. Okay, so we'll just have a quick run through about uh, what's in the night sky at the moment. This is starting off in the, the evening sky. Uh, we've got the familiar summer constellations are gradually disappearing down into the west. Um, and Vega here and, and Lyra. Now, Lyra's been in the news quite a bit recently. Those of you who were at the October BAA meeting may have heard me mentioning um, an object that had just been discovered that looked like it was an object from interstellar space. That's this object, which is now called Um 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 Mia or something like that, uh, which is a name from the native Hawaiian language, which means something like scout or fur scout or something like that. Um, it's caused a lot of controversy, this, because the Minor Planet Center have invented a whole new way of designating objects. Um, which is this thing. So if you think about the way that objects are designated, you have numbers for asteroids, comets are called 1P, 2, 1P is Halley, 2P is Anchor. 
This is the first interstellar object, so it's called 1i. Um, but this is causing all sorts of problems with all sorts of people because i's and 1's are easy to, to get sort of misinterpret because of the way that typefaces work on computers. And the fact that this, this um, it's not an apostrophe, it's, it's part of the punctuation of this name, actually appears at the start of the, the name, has caused all sorts of problems. And the Minor Planet Centre themselves actually screwed up because recently on their website, they have a website of the most recent observations of particular objects, and suddenly there was an observation of Comet Halley, which is 1p. Um, and they'd mixed up, in fact, they were observations of 1i. Anyway, this is a really interesting object. It's the first time that we've ever seen for sure an object that's come into the solar system from outside of our solar system. It's in an orbit which is highly um, hyperbolic, about 1.2 eccentricity. It has had a velocity at infinity, so that's the velocity at which it entered the solar system, of 25 kilometers a second, which is far in excess of anything that we've ever seen before. And the big question is whether this is the first of many, whether we've, we've seen our one interstellar object and that's it, we've been very lucky, or whether these things will be much more common in future because we have much more sensitive surveys. Anyway, a very, very interesting object. Um, if you project its orbit back, it came from the direction of sort of Vega. Vega is only 26 light years away. However, it took far longer to get here than 26 years. And in fact, if you, if you project Vega's motion away, it was a long way away from where it came from. So the most likely origin was a solar system uh, many, many hundreds or thousands of light years away. And this thing's been traveling through intergalactic space for billions of years. Anyway, it's fascinating. It's the first time we've ever seen an object like this. And what makes it even more fascinating is that the light curve of this object implies that it has the largest length to width, width ratio of any object that we've ever seen. Something like 800 meters long by 100 meters wide. That looks seriously non-natural to me, but I won't say anything about that because <laughs> just in case the Daily Mail picks up on the fact that... <laughs> BAA astronomer claims life from interstellar space. Anyway, those who are into science fiction might think this is rather familiar. Has anyone ever read Arthur Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama? It's, I'm not a great fan of Arthur Clarke's writing. I think it's a bit turgid. But I mean, he, he, did, he did predict a lot of things. I mean, there's a lot of technically good stuff in there. And Rama was an object that was discovered by um, a, a thing called Space Watch. Um, in 2130, 20, when they were looking for um, effectively what we do now, looking for potential Earth impactors, but they were using radars on Mars. It was discovered, and the first thing that people realized was odd about it was its light curve, and then they calculated its orbit, and it was a strongly hyperbolic orbit. Anyway, it's worth reading the book. It's a good book. Um, they basically send a spacecraft to it and find it's a an alien spacecraft. And I'm not saying that Uma Mama is anything like that, but it's, it's an interesting parallel and it's, it's quite interesting to read the book and see how the technology is, is kind of predicted by Arthur Clarke. There's, there's quite a lot of parallels with what we saw with this object. Anyway, going through uh, as the night progresses, uh, we've got a few interesting things in the early evening. Uranus and Neptune. So Uranus is in Pisces at the moment. Uh, Neptune is in Aquarius, gradually disappearing from view. And we've also got the uh, very interesting long period variable star, Myra, Omicron Ceti, which is coming up to a maximum soon. So here are a few images from amateurs. Uh, John Sussenbach's image of Uranus here, uh, Cardassus image of Neptune, and a really nice one, I think, by Martin Lewis uh, of Uranus and its moons. So again, a nice demonstration of what you can do on very small objects uh, with modern telescopes and webcam processing. Uh, a nice, nice demonstration here as well in a time lapse of actually imaging a storm on Neptune with an amateur telescope. Uh, again, pretty impressive thing to do. Uh, this is uh, Myra. Its maximum's due sometime in late January. Uh, it gets up to easy naked eye visibility. So have a look at Cetus um, and, and just keep an eye on it over the next month or so and you'll see Myra brightening up. Uh, should reach its maximum in January and then late January and then will fade back down again. 
Um, just moving around a bit further, this is looking north now. Uh, obviously we've got Ursa Minor, the pole star here. And at the moment there is a comet very, very close to the pole star. Uh, this comet called 2017-01, um, ASASSN, and this is another of those controversial names because uh, for a while, the authorities who named comets refused to use this. This actually stands for the Automated Survey for Supernovae, or um, something like that. Uh, but they obviously thought it sounded a bit too much like assassin. Um, and so for a while, this comet had no name until they relented and they, uh, they allowed it to have a name. But at the moment, this comet is very, very close to the pole. It's about 86 and a half degrees declination at the moment. We'd hoped it would have been rather brighter than it has been. It's, it's been a bit of a disappointment, I think. But Peter, Peter Carson uh, took an image of it the other day. And, and here it is. It's definitely a comet. But uh, even though I'm the director of the comet section, I don't think it's something that uh, I would encourage people to get too excited about. Um, going around a bit further in the east, uh, in, the, in the early evening, we've got the constellations of winter rising. So, of course, Gemini, Auriga, um, Orion, of course, over here, and Taurus. And those are the constellations that have, you know, the really nice celestial lollipops that, uh, that, that it's kind of like, I don't know, Beethoven symphonies in the sense is that people get very sniffy about them because, you know, they're, they're around all the time and, you, you know, they're played on classic FM and whatever, so they can't be any good. <laughs> Um, these are the same, you know, people will get very sniffy about the Orion Nebula and, and the Pleiades, but in fact the reason that they're around a lot is they're just fantastic things it, it, at all sorts of focal lengths. So it, this is the time of year when you have a really cold, dark, crisp night, like, a bit like the night was last night before the moon rose, of course, and spoiled everything. Um, to actually get a get to look at these things, and if you get if you're lucky enough to be able to look at something like the Orion Nebula in a large telescope, as I was at Kelling a few years ago, in uh, Andrew Robertson's um, 24 inch is it or 22 inch 21 inch, it's an extraordinary thing to look at this thing visually. But even in small instruments, to actually have a look at the Orion Nebula in a in a, a small to medium sized telescope, the amount of detail that's there is is astonishing. So don't just let, let the fact that it's a common thing, you know, you've seen it many times before, discourage you from looking at it. It's something that every winter, um, it's something I like doing, just kind of reminding myself what a spectacular object it is. And of course, by midnight, Orion is pretty much on the meridian at its best at this time of year. Um, and you've got the Milky Way down through Monoceros uh, with the Rosette Nebula, which is another nice object um, to have a go at imaging. Um, so, so this whole sky really is full of all sorts of interesting deep sky objects. Um, over in the east, rising, you've got the, the constellations of spring. Uh, so, so you've got Leo coming up here. Um, and basically this, this is a much, uh, I suppose, less interesting from from a really sort of spectacular object point of view part of the sky because, because this is away from the Milky Way. So you've got, you've got more galaxies here, uh, and particularly once you get round into Virgo, uh, but it's still an interesting part of the sky to look at. And of course you've got Gemini here, which is rising high in the sky, which I'll be talking about in a minute, uh, because in a few days' time we've got the Geminid meteors coming up. And then right at dawn, uh, you'll have noticed I haven't mentioned much about the bright planets, and that's because, a bit like the solar section director and the comet section director, the directors of most of the other planet sections are redundant at the moment, at least for a while. Um, we've got Jupiter and Mars rising in the east. So those planets will become much better later in the year, and David Arditi is doing the sky notes in uh, January, so we'll be able to tell you a bit more about them. But in the meantime, we've got the the opposition of Mars to look forward to next summer. It's a perihelic opposition, which means that Mars gets to an absolutely phenomenal 24 and a half arc seconds in diameter, which is really large for Mars. Uh, but unfortunately, as with all perihelic oppositions, uh, it's at a declination of about minus 25. Um, so it's one of those occasions, again, where the southern hemisphere really is the place to be for planets over the next uh, few years. 
Uh, Jupiter, of course, as well, is coming around. Ooh. Okay. Well, it would be coming around if the laptop hadn't ground to halt. Oh, ooh. There was a brief view of Jupiter there. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give up on Jupiter. Sorry, sorry, John. Um, but, uh, of course, one of the, the things with Ju Jupiter is the Juno mission that's currently uh, in orbit around Jupiter. Lots of very impressive pictures from Juno coming. And um, we also will, will be having Jupiter coming more uh, available to us as it rises up in the in the morning sky over the next few months still though unfortunately at a, an increasingly sudden declination right um, this was rather nice this this made the news this is uh, Richard Fleet's meteor camera at Wilcott in Wiltshire picked up this really spectacular fireball um, a few weeks ago uh, this was reported very widely um, over the country. Um, people presumably, it's about almost exactly midnight, so people stumbling home from the pubs would have, would have seen this in the skies. Um, what's nice these days is that there are now so many meteor cameras operating over the UK uh, that usually if people actually see these things, we're actually picking them up on cameras. Um, there was another one recently, if I can get to it, this one. Um, and this is just a demonstration of, of what we can do in terms of seeing these objects simultaneously from two different locations to be able to compute their orbits. So this is the same object, one from Chelmsford, low in the north here, and this is up from this is uh, William Stewart's camera in Cheshire, showing the, the object moving across. And what you can do, of course, when you, you have multiple camera detections is that you can calculate orbits. And you can do it even for stations really far apart. This is actually quite unusual, but this is two objects that were picked up from Dennis up in uh, Tarbot Ness, where he sees all those lovely aurorae, and Chelmsford, where I see the Essex Police helicopter. Um, but we both, both saw the same object. And with that triangulation, we can calculate orbits. And this is an example between me and, and Richard Fleet, where we've actually calculated the orbits of this meteor stream, which is the Geminids. And so this is the big event coming up next week. Uh, Geminids, they reach a maximum on the night of the 13th, 14th of December, which I think is Wednesday, Thursday night, this coming week. Uh, they're, they're about the me best meteor shower that we have. Uh, they're better than the Perseid meteor shower, it's just they, they don't get as much kind of publicity because they happen in the winter and the Perseids are nice, nice warm summer nights. But definitely if it's clear next Wednesday, Thursday, get out and observe the Geminids. Um, this is an example of last year's Geminids, which uh, we calculated the orbits of the Geminids, and you might notice that they all seem to follow the same kinds of orbits. And the reason for that is that they come from a, a single parent body. And everyone knows that meteors come from comets. They're the dust left behind comets as they move around the solar system. Except in the case of the Geminids, they don't. They come from an asteroid. They come from this asteroid, um, which is called 3200 Phaeton. Or Phaethon. Phaethon? Phaethon? Um, anyway, here it is. And uh, it's actually an asteroid which is in a very odd orbit. It's in a very eccentric orbit, a bit like a cometary orbit. Um, but it, it doesn't have any volatiles, it doesn't have the ices that comets normally have. But it does pass very close to the Sun. It passes, I think, something like 0.15 AU from the Sun at its closest and gets very, very hot. Uh, and so dust comes off its surface because of that, and this, this thing actually leaves a trail of dust around the Sun, which turns into the Geminid meteors. Um, this year, it's at its closest to the Earth, almost at the time of maximum of the Geminids. So we can actually watch the Geminid meteor shower and the progenitor of the Geminid meteor shower at the same time. Uh, this is its track at the moment. At the moment it's up in Auriga. It's moving quickly across the sky, accelerating as it moves at its closest to the Earth. It'll be, move through um, Pegasus and then down very quickly uh, we'll lose sight of it as it goes south. Um, I took some pictures of it last night. This is it moving through the stars of Auriga. There it is. So this, this object is, is the thing that actually gives rise to the dust that we're going to see 
over the next few nights uh, as the Geminid meteors. So definitely worth a look out for. It, re it will reach about a magnitude of maybe 10, 10 and a half or so at its closest approach uh, towards the end of next week, so next Friday. Um, so again, if it's clear, you've got a um, small telescope, it's worth searching it out. Um, and just to actually see the thing that gives rise to the meteors that we'll be observing through the week. Um, last year, the Geminids were really badly affected by the moon. Uh, these are some Geminids I captured last year, but one of the things about these video camera systems now is that they will actually work through very bright moons. So, um, despite the fact the sky was, was actually partially cloudy on, on maximum night last year and the moon was nearly full, um, I still managed to pick up about 150 Geminid trails um, overnight at the maximum. So, this year, the real big advantage is that the moon is pretty much out of the way, it's nearly new moon, so we've got conditions that are nearly as good as they can be. The maximum is almost perfectly placed for Europe uh, on the night of the 13th, 14th, and, uh, and the moon's out of the way. Uh, and here's one I captured earlier, this is uh, from yesterday morning, this is a Geminid um, that I, I caught on my camera system yesterday morning, so they are coming. And then this is another one I got uh, yesterday evening. If you look down here, it'll appear in a minute. This is what meteor observing's like. There we go. And you see it left a really nice green trail. This is um, video shot with a, a Sony um, A7S DSLR camera, which is actually one of the most incredibly sensitive things I've ever seen in my life. This is uh, 80,000 ISO video at 25 frames a second, um, which is quite impressive stuff. So uh, it, it produces huge amounts of data and so actually processing this is proving a bit of a challenge at the moment. So this is actually Gemini, so you've got Castor and Pollux here, so the radiant is actually up here somewhere, which is why you see the meteor. But the nice thing is you get the colour as well um, and uh, yeah, some really nice video too. Um, people are detecting these things by radar. Uh, uh, this is an example of a, a meteor um, where it's effectively reflecting the radio signal from a radar in France called Graves. Uh, we tune the radi our radios to a particular radio frequency which normally doesn't have anything on it because you can't receive this signal directly and every time a meteor comes along, a, a big meteor comes along in the beam of the radar, we can get a backscatter back that we can receive in, in very simple radio receivers. And this is a system I, I built using a, a little dongle that you can buy off eBay for about £15. And it's quite effective at, at uh, receiving meteor backscatter. Um, okay, so another aspect of the Geminids this year is the moon's out of the, the sky pretty much most of the night, but it is there in the early morning sky. It's a very thin crescent moon. And Tony Cook has got a project to actually look for impacts of Geminid meteoroids on the moon. And so that will involve using a high sensitivity video camera or a webcam to actually image the moon at 25 frames a second. And um, then he has software and there is software which will actually detect these impacts. So have a look on the BAA website. Um, you need to have a system that can detect um, stars at about magnitude 9 or 10 in 25 frame per second video, um, but which has got a sufficient field of view that it can actually take, a, uh, take in the, the sort of a, a, a large enough part of the unilluminated part of the moon. So this, this was actually some tests I was doing on a system uh, that I'm going to use. Um, for this, this was obviously the moon is a much bigger phase here on, on the morning of um, the 13th, it'll be a thin crescent. Uh, but this is using an ASI 120M webcam uh, running at 25 frames a second and on the same system with the moon out of the way, um, this is actually M35 at 25 frames a second and I, I've got stars on here at about mag 10 and a half or so. So if you've got a system that you think could be able to do this, it's worth having a go. Look on the website, look at what Tony's written for what you need to do um, in order to, to get the data he needs. 
Right, then just a, a few final things. There's a couple of other meteor showers, just in case you don't get to see the Geminids. There's the Ursids, so if you... Uh, they have a maximum around the 23rd of December, but they, they actually go up over Christmas, so if you feel the need to avoid, I don't know, playing Monopoly or whatever you do on <laughs> Christmas night, you've got the excuse of going out to, um, to observe the, uh, the Ursid meteor showers. Uh, the moon is new on the 18th. It's, it's becoming more and more of a problem um, as the, the shower progresses. And we've also got the Quadrantids. Uh, next January on the 3rd but that's really badly hit by the moon because this year the maximum is at the point where the radiance lowest in the sky and it's almost a full moon as well. So the Geminids are really the best bet for what we think we can uh, do meteor wise and I'd certainly say if you if you can next Wednesday night uh, or even before that get out and, and have a look for some Geminids. Um, there have been quite a few supernova discoveries. I wanted to show this one. This is a typical Ron Arbor supernova discovery uh, because here's the supernova there, so close to the centre of the galaxy that hardly anyone else would have ever spotted it. So congratulations for Ron. He, he does a fantastic job picking up these very difficult to find supernovae. Um, we've also had quite a lot of novae discovered in M31. Um, George Carey uh, co-discovered a nova recently in this galaxy and in fact M31 is surveyed so much for novae now and variables that there are many of them to see. In this little square box here which is reproduced down here there are four simultaneous novae that I imaged um, a month or so ago. So it's, it's, uh, if you're interested in having a go at discovering variables and novae this is a, a good place to, to start. You just need to be very quick because a lot of people are actually surveying this galaxy for, for these objects. Um, I mean I've picked up a couple because I, I tend to image this galaxy at the start of the night um, at this time of the year because it's easy to get to and I do it while the camera is settling down and cooling down and I then quickly blink images and I've had a couple of cases where I've picked up a new object got really excited and then looked on the transient reporting page and found that someone had already found it uh, but, but there's a lot of scope there for finding stuff in M31 um, a couple of final things. This is another really nice example of Pro-Am cooperation. This is um, a variable object that was picked up by the Assassin survey and uh, it was also picked up I think by a Japanese amateur reported as a, a variable um, but amateur spectroscopists managed to take spectro, spectra of this star and showed that there was nothing unusual about the spectrum at all. And that was the first indication that this wasn't anything inherent about the star, but that what we were seeing was a gravitational microlens. So we were actually seeing an object moving precisely in line with the star that we were observing, and gravitational bending of the light, focusing the light towards us and increasing the magnitude. And uh, this is a really nice simple one. You can see the model fits extremely well with the data. But we've seen ones in the past where there are little wiggles on this light curve which are indicative potentially of a planet. So really interesting. And another case where amateur spectroscopists have done a fantastic job. They've taken spectra of these objects very quickly after they've been discovered and alerted people to the fact that this was a potential microlensing event. So just moving a little bit later in the month, um, right at the end of December is a good opportunity to see Mercury low in the morning sky, uh, along with Jupiter and Mars as well. Um, and also we have an occultation of Aldebaran on the morning of the 31st of uh, December. So this is the morning of the 31st, so you can still go out on the evening of the 31st. <laughs> This is not the morning of the 1st of January. So this is uh, 0048 UTC on the morning of the 31st of December, moon crossing the Hyades and the nice occultation of Aldebaran. And then finally, uh, there's, uh, we're at the stage where we've got some really good evening passes of ISS. There was one that we missed about an hour ago. Um, this is for tomorrow night. Uh, this is a pass where the ISS goes into shadow at the zenith and I did this yesterday. This is a, a pass which was almost exactly the same as the pass that we're having tomorrow. This is again with this Sony A7 camera with a 200mm lens on the front shooting video. Uh, this is the ISS. It's, um, it's moving up through Cygnus and what you'll see in a minute is it enters the Earth's shadow 
uh, it turns a kind of orangey color and then disappears and it's worth even though again you may have seen the ISS many many times it's worth watching a pass with a pair of binoculars when it goes into shadow to see how far you can track the spacecraft into the Earth's shadow unfortunately a bit like tomorrow night this happened at the zenith and I was tracking this just on a simple photographic tripod and you see that basically when it hits the zenith so it's fading now it turns a kind of orangey colour and then it disappears and then unfortunately I hit the limits of the, um, <laughs> the tripod. But you can sort of see it disappearing off, off the end. So have a look for that tomorrow, uh, about 18.30 the pass if we get clear weather. So all of this of course does depend on the weather. And there are a lot of ways these days online that we can go on about looking at what the weather is going to be doing. So for the critical day next week, um, 14th, 13th, 14th, the BBC website is currently predicting light cloud. Um, now all of this is based on, on forecasts from the Met Office and the European Centre for Medium Range Forecasting where they have massive supercomputers. Uh, you can look on, online now, you can download uh, images from Meteosat, uh, and there are even sites that, that will predict cloud cover. But we had a discussion on this a few weeks ago where various people, and Gary Poignier was adamant that none of these were worth anything and that his cat was actually a far better way of predicting the weather. Because apparently it licked its ears. No, it can't lick its ears. It, it did something. Well, it did something when clear skies were, were due. But he said... <laughs> ask, ask Gary later. I can't remember the exact details. But, but he said he had something even more uh, useful for predicting the weather, and that was this thing. It's called a weather owl. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? Apparently, this, this owl changes colour depending on whether it's going to be clear or cloudy. And according to Gary, it's a far better predictor of clear skies than, than anything from the Met Office. So there you go. <laughs> That's, that's what we should be doing with Brexit and everything else. We should just be investing in weather owls and, and we'll all know about the weather. Anyway, uh, I hope you found that interesting. Please go out and, and watch the Geminids. Lots of stuff happening over the next few weeks. And from all of us in the BAA, happy Christmas. Thank you very much. <laughs>